Hello and welcome to Legal Links, a legal information program brought to you by the Oregon State Bar. My name is Paul Nickel. I'm the editor of the Oregon State Bar Bulletin and your host for today's program. Today we will be discussing bicycle law in Oregon. Useful information for bike riders and the drivers who may encounter bicycle riders on the road. With us today are two experts on this subject, Ray Thomas and Jessica Roberts. Ray Thomas is a partner with Swanson, Thomas and Kuhn. He is a Portland bike lawyer and the author of Pedal Power, a legal guide for Oregon bicyclists. Jessica Roberts is a metro area advocate for the Bicycle Transportation Alliance. Her experience with public process, transportation funding and policy, and grassroots organizing, as well as formal training in bicycle facilities design, have allowed her to effectively advocate for better conditions for Oregonians who choose to bicycle. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica, let me ask you, what, is the, what are the biggest mistakes made by cyclists? Well, by biggest mistakes, I define that not as most annoying things cyclists do, but rather uh, what are the most dangerous mistakes cyclists can make. Um, and what we see is that uh, the worst things you can do um, if you, know, you want to stay out of trouble on your bike is um, bike against traffic. Um, that's probably the very worst one. I've heard between that that uh, results in a three to four times greater chance that you'll be involved in a crash. Uh, bicycling without lights at night um, and uh, uh, bicycling on the sidewalk is also really dangerous. So um, our education efforts um, try to help people understand that by not doing those three things, you can really be a lot safer. So that's the top three right mm -hmm. there. Uh, Ray, what are the, so let's talk about the interaction between automobile drivers and bicycles. What are the main ways car drivers fail to understand how to drive around bicyclists? Well, uh, Paul, the, uh, the fact is, is that you know, there's kind of a, a common uh, mistaken idea, which is uh, based upon that old saying, you know, once you know how to ride a bike, you never forget. But the fact is, is that most folks, uh, they probably didn't ride a bike too much after they were out of grade school. And so uh, when they see people who are riding bikes now, adults who are commuters or sport riders, um, the experience of going 20 to 25 miles an hour on a uh, crowded two-lane road is very different from uh, being in sixth or seventh grade and riding on the sidewalk. So the the kind of lack of understanding of what it takes and what the skills are to drive around bikes um, is coupled with the fact that t car drivers really sometimes um, look at uh, bike riders like they're deer on the roadway. You know, you never know which way a deer is going to go. Is it going to jump on the hood or what? And so uh, what we need to do is to get the word out to car drivers about what the rules of the road are for car drivers around bikes, but also what can they expect bicyclists to do so that bicyclists are riding in a safe, predicta predictable way so it's easier to drive around them. Mm. Well, it, and it's, turn, it's interesting. Let's turn that around. What are the main ways bike riders fail to understand how to interact with automobiles? Well, one of the things is, is that for some reason, some folks, when they get on a bicycle, forget uh, that uh, they've got the same legal rights and responsibilities as a vehicle. In Oregon law, a bicycle is a vehicle. It's subject to the same rules of the road as cars. What that means is, is that you could get a DUI, you could get reckless driving, stop sign violations, stoplight violations. The same rules apply to all of us. And the fact is, is that if we want to be able to have our right to the roadway as bicyclists, we also have to follow our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting because, I, I mean, do people actually get cited for the very kind of violations that you've commented as cyclists? Well, one of the things about being a, a bike lawyer that uh, I see in the last 25 years I've been doing this is that it's not that often that a police officer is really going to cite a bicyclist. Now, sometimes they do, but the fact is when you think about law enforcement priorities and funding levels in the state of Oregon, bicyclists maybe committing a stop sign violation is going to be pretty low on the level of priority in terms of what's going to happen. Not that there aren't citations issued, but the fact is is that we have to take those realities into account. But the problem is that for a bicyclist who maybe fails to stop at a stop sign or fails to follow the rules of the road in some other way, when they get in an accident, then the fact that they fail to follow the law really comes back to haunt them. Mm, interesting. Because while it may be that the police officer let them go, an insurance company claims adjuster is going to nitpick 
what the bicyclist conduct was in following the law. Let's talk about accidents for a, for a bit. What, where do most accidents occur? And that's bicycle accidents, I'm assuming, uh, with automobiles. Where do, those yeah. most, mo where do those mostly occur, Jessica? Well, uh, one of the things I, I should probably say first is that we're coming to call them crashes instead of accidents because there are very few crashes that occur that really were accidents where no one could have done anything. So we're really defining those to emphasize that they're preventable. Um, so when we look at where crashes occur between uh, bicycles and motor vehicles, um, overwhelmingly those happen on arterial streets, so big busy streets with lots of fast moving car traffic. Now, um, you might say, well, there are just a lot of people there, that's why there are a lot of crashes, but actually we know that bicycles tend to, or bicyclists tend to avoid those roads. So it's quite disproportional, the number of crashes that occur uh, on these, on or crossing these major um, state highways or, or really busy fast roads um, uh, compared to how many bicycles are, are actually on those roads, and that's something we're really concerned about. Um, these facilities are not being designed properly to keep everyone safe. Are there, are there places that bicycles shouldn't go? Are, are, you, are you suggesting that? Well, you know, we think the law is um, basically reasonable. Um, you can ride a bike almost anywhere uh, in the state of Oregon. There are some limited access freeways where you're not allowed to ride a bike. Um, you are allowed to ride your bike on the shoulder of, of lots of freeways. And as someone who's actually ridden across the state of Oregon, I'll tell you, sometimes you don't have another alternative. Mm -hmm. and, and you can do that in a safe way. Um, but. Uh, you know, our concern as an advocacy group is um, both protecting your legal right to do, um, you know, what you're allowed to do, but also helping educate everyone so you can make the most informed, safe decisions possible. Um, so some of that, you know, how, how can we get those down? Well, some of it is better crossings, um, better signage, motorist education, but I think part of the key is providing better facilities that where you don't have to ride on that mm. busy, busy state highway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, arterial roads are only 30% of our roadway network. There's 70% of what I consider really fantastic neighborhood roads out there um, that you might prefer to ride on if I help you find them. Very good. Well, let's talk about some of the law. What are some of the legal areas of greatest concern for bicyclists? Well, I'm the metro area advocate for the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, so I get the calls. <laughs> When there's a bicyclist who's upset about something or concerned about something, I'm likely to hear about it, and then maybe Ray, too, when I refer them to you. Um, so what I really see is uh, cyclists are very concerned about um, aggressive motorists or reckless driving. Um, they're concerned about uh, what they perceive as improper or insufficient follow-up when there is a collision between uh, a car and a bicycle. Um, they're really concerned about drunk driving. There's a very strong feeling in the bicycling community that drunk driving is a problem that, that endangers vulnerable um, populations like pedestrians and cyclists unfairly and that not enough is being done to prevent and follow up on drunk driving. Um, there's a great sense of powerlessness about that. Um, uh, and uh, one of the um, other things I'd, I'd actually point out um, that's a little more controversial, there's not agreement in the bicycling community on this, but um, is uh, the question of whether um, bikes should um, have certain laws that are different than cars. So, you know, ca as, as Ray said, bikes are just vehicles under the um, Oregon Revised Statutes. Um, but on the other hand, the, the experience of riding a bicycle and sort of the characteristics of that vehicle are really different than a car. Um, so where that really comes into play is stop signs. Um, you know, most bikes get down to, you know, about three miles an hour at a stop mm -hmm. sign. And when you look at the purpose of a stop sign, um, you know, it's to make sure people get, you know, aren't having collisions and that right of way is clear. So uh, the state of Idaho actually um, created a statute that said bicyclists may treat stop signs as yield signs um, when no vehicles are present. Did I get that right, Ray? Okay. And they have not seen, um, the interpretation is there hasn't been any problem with that, that that's worked pretty well. So I get plenty of calls from bicyclists who, who want to know, can we do that in Oregon? I also get some calls from bicyclists as well as motorists who say, you know, over my dead body. Mm. Um, that's a terrible idea. It would cause confusion in the street. So that's... And to be clear, that is not the law in Oregon. That is Oregon. not the law in Oregon. It was proposed, uh, I believe, in the 2003 mm -hmm. legislative session. It was not passed. 
So treat those stop signs as stop signs. That's right, that's right. Okay. I don't, I don't want you to get in a crash or get in trouble. Uh, let's talk about sidewalks. You, you mentioned that, Ray. I'd like to follow up with that. What, is, what are the legal rights of a cyclist using a sidewalk? Well, uh, the, the rights of a bicyclist to the sidewalk is, uh, uh, you, you heard Jessica talk about how it is that sidewalks tend sometimes to be places where uh, you cannot maintain the same safe speed as you can on the roadway because, of course, the speed on sidewalks has to be slower because they're filled with pedestrians and drivers are not expecting uh, people on sidewalks to be going as fast as they expect them to be in the roadway. But the law in the state of Oregon is, is that bicyclists have the right to not only ride where they wish on a sidewalk, but also on the roadway unless it's otherwise prohibited. And what has happened is that a number of Oregon cities and towns uh, have prohibited uh, bicycle riding on the sidewalks in the urban core areas where there's a high population of density for uh, pedestrians because it's a safety hazard. The problem is, is that many of these laws that exist, unfortunately, um, have not been accompanied by an informational campaign that tells people who are in the town where it is that they can and can't ride on the sidewalk, so it creates a lot of confusion. Um, so on, what we did was sort of laboriously uh, go through the uh, websites and the statute books and ordinances for a number of uh, Oregon's towns and cities, and we've assembled them uh, both for the Pedal Power book and uh, on our website, which is uh, stc-law.com. And um, what we what we find is that uh, a number of the towns say that, you know, basically in the downtown core area where the businesses are, you're not supposed to ride on the sidewalk. But for many parents, what they want to have their kids do uh, in the neighborhoods is to be on the sidewalk before the kids feel confident enough or the parents are confident enough to put them in the street. And so we have an absolute legal right uh, to ride on the sidewalk where it's otherwise not prohibited. Is, uh, is it posted generally or not? Mm -hmm. It's generally not posted, and that's part of the problem. And I, I mean, I hate to use Portland as a negative example, but um, Portland uh, prohibits 24 hours a day, seven days a week, riding in the urban core area with a maximum fine of $500. And I mean, when you think about the fact that uh, uh, those sidewalks are practically deserted much of the time. It doesn't very make much sense. And the fact is, is that the signing to alert people and the visitors to the city that uh, you cannot ride your bike on the sidewalk is non-existent. Same thing in many of the cities and towns across the state. So um, the th best thing to do is to check with your city or town, check with our uh, website, and find out what the rules are so that you can know where you can legally ride and not ride on the sidewalk. I gather that bicycle law is quickly evolving. What kinds, and you alluded to the legislature, what kind of changes have occurred recently? Well, the 2005 legislature uh, really took a good look at uh, reform and updating bicycle law because one of the things that we've wanted to do is to make it so the law takes into account safe riding practices. And so the 2005 legislature passed and was signed in, into law by the governor and, and effective on January 1, 2006, the first of this year, uh, a law that takes uh, the riding conditions into account in allowing a bicyclist who's in a bike lane or on a bike path um, to leave that bike lane if they need to. For example, if there's a, a car parked in the bike lane and the rider cannot uh, get through, they can leave the bike lane legally. Same thing to make a left or a right turn when necessary or if there's a hazardous condition like gravel. And what the legislature did was they applied a common sense approach to make it so that the law recognizes bicyclist practices. And the thing is, you know, um, when many folks started driving, bike lanes didn't even exist. And so what we've had to do is kind of create not only the faci this new facility, but also to create the accompanying law, which makes it clear for folks where they can and can't ride. So that was the first change. The second change is one that c allows Oregonians to follow what is really the worldwide and universal practice of making it so that instead of having to stop in a line of uh, stopped cars, um, and wait when the right side of the roadway is completely clear. If you can proceed safely, and I don't mean um, going on the right to go around a right-turning motorist or some 
situation that's obviously unsafe but if you have a line of cars that's going straight and they're all stopped you can move on the right side of the roadway and pass on the right to get up in front of those cars so for example if they're stopped at a traffic a traffic light or a stop sign you can move up to the front and be alongside them and everybody starts and you know there's kind of a ballet that occurs mm -hmm. and what it is it's the cars start and the bikes start when the light changes and we kind of move forward together but the cars go faster so they get ahead of us and they pass us and then when we get go on and get to the next light maybe the lights turned and then we we'll catch up and we kind of go back and forth and what we do is we cooperatively share the road and that's the way people do it throughout the world so we've got that in law in Oregon now too very good yeah, how, how well do you think Oregonians understand bicycle law yeah well that's the question I mean we can we can discuss what the laws are but do people understand them that's really a very good question and I don't think they understand them very well I get the calls from people who have questions for me. Um, I see the letters to the editor. I mean, when reporters ask me questions, it's really clear that um, everyone needs to know more about um, how to get, well, how to get along and also what rights and responsibilities we all have. So I'll hear from bicyclists who, it's a real catch-22. If you're on the roadway, some motorist will drive by and shout, get on the sidewalk. If you're on the sidewalk, some motorist will drive by and say, get off the sidewalk. When really, in most cases, you're, you have the legal right to do both. Um, though, as Ray mentioned, you know, you should always do what's safe and reasonable. Um, and unfortunately, I also hear uh, more often than I'd like to of uh, cases where police officers are um, instructing cyclists to do something that is illegal, um, like get on the sidewalk, for example, or in downtown, that actually happened recently. Um, or in the case of you know, a, a crash report, uh, writing it up so that the cyclist rights are not being upheld, or even so that the assignment of fault is, is completely opposite of the law. Um, I, I'm sure many police officers understand bike law, but too many don't. So it's clear we need to better educate everybody. Mm. Ray, why do, is it that bicycle riders, I have a specific question I want to ask about, ride so far out from the shoulder? Well, there are, you know, I was saying that one of the things that people think about is, well, if you know how to ride a bike, you never forget. And what was the practice when you're a young person and riding a single speed uh, bike is very different from riding one of the new, uh, you know, bicycles in the roadway. And so, what folks need to understand is that the bicyclists have, uh, you know, a very light vehicle, but and it has very high pressure tires, and so when you ride on the road, the fact is is that you're s actually subject to buffeting from side wind, fr even from a vehicle that comes by, and it actually causes you to be in a situation where if you ride too close to the edge of the pavement, you could be by a passing bus or truck or by a, gust, a sudden gust of wind pushed into a situation where suddenly you're not on the pavement anymore but you're on an unpaved shoulder and that would be very dangerous. The other thing is is that as bicyclists we're in a position where oftentimes when we're trying to stay as far to the right as we can we find that the that part of the roadway does not get swept regularly either by maintenance crews or swept by the tires of the passing vehicles such that it has a lot of debris. So when you can look ahead and see that there's gravel, that there maybe there's a pothole or maybe glass or something of that nature, it's important for the bicyclist to have the flexibility to be able to move into that portion of the roadway where they can um, actually maneuver and safely go around those things. So what we try to do is maintain a comfortable uh, spacing on the roadway because really the safest place from the bicyclist perspective to ride, now I'm not talking about in a bike lane, but where we're sharing the lane with motorists, mm -hmm. is in that paved portion of the roadway where the vehicle tires are actually going, making it so that that portion of the road is smooth and clean of debris. So I'm, uh, I'm in this position frequently. You're the cyclist and I'm the motorist and I'm approaching you from behind and you're in that exact spot. Yes. Do I pass you? Do I, I signal and get in the other lane right. and pass you? In other words, how close can I get to you? Well, that's a, good, uh, that's a good point because let me tell you what the bus driver teachers teach the bus drivers. And that is to approach a bicyclist as if at any moment that bicyclist 
could actually flop over and fall into the roadway. I don't mean suddenly veer into the roadway, but if they were just to fall over, you should drive and pass that bicyclist as if when that happened, you would not be in a position where you would hit them or come very, very close to them. And a lot of car drivers are confused about the situation where when you see a bicyclist ahead of you and let's say they're on the inside, on the, on the road side of the fog line, and it's a double yellow line. In other words, it's not a place where it, a person can safely pass if it was a motor vehicle, for example. Well, the fact is what you're doing with that bicyclist is the two of you are cooperating. The bicyclist is cooperating in letting you pass and get by safely, and you're cooperating in giving that bicyclist the amount of the road that they need to safely move forward and to team up to take into account that there is traffic coming in the opposing direction. Now, some car drivers mistakenly think that they cannot cross the double yellow line in order to go around that bicyclist, but that's not correct. The law is actually that when a condition exists such that you are in a place in a position as a driver that you must cross over the yellow line, such as for a bicyclist up ahead of you, you may cross over, go around that bicyclist. You don't have to sit back there and wait for a bicyclist going 15 miles an hour when you're in a 50 mile an hour zone and say, well, I can't go around the bike rider even though there's no oncoming traffic because there's a double yellow line. You can move around that bicyclist and give that bike rider sufficient space so that if they fell over, they would be fine. Let me throw another scenario at you, and that is there's a bicycle lane and maybe you're obstructed by traffic for some other reason. As an automobile driver, can you drive onto the bicycle lane? Can you turn across it? Can you use it to, to pass even? Well, here's the, uh, the law about uh, bicycle lanes and the use by motor vehicles is something that's poorly understood by car drivers and bicycle riders because the fact is is that car drivers are restricted um, from passing over bike lanes unless there is no bicyclist occupying that same space. In other words, car drivers must yield to bicycles in bike lanes. And there are circumstances where a car driver can cross over the bike lane, such as for turning, such as for in the course of official duty, such as when they're moving over the bike lane to park, and they may cross over the bike lane, but the fact is, is they must, before they do that, before they enter the bike lane, they must yield to bicyclists. Can I get into the bike lane to take a right turn? Absolutely. And one of the, and I don't want to confuse people, but one of the things is that just as the law for bicyclist use of bike lanes is sort of, you know, kind of, we're kind of uh, learning and developing it as we go. So, for example, we are working to develop the law as it relates to when motorists can be on bike lanes. And so one of the legislative proposals that we're looking toward for the 2007 legislature is to, through the Bicycle Transportation Alliance uh, Legislative Committee, to allow motorists to cross into a bike lane to go around a left-turning motorist who would otherwise mm. be blocking their path. As, as the law presently stands, it does not recognize that. And in fact, we had a legislator's husband who was cited uh, uh, for and uh, ticketed for that thing. So th through the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, what we're trying to do is to help the law to sort of evolve, to take into account the fact that in this particular example, so long as you yield to a bike rider who's in the lane, if there's nobody in the lane, it, doesn't it seem like you should be able to go around? Well, it's really, all, all these laws are really about safety, aren't they? And um, uh, th we don't have much time left, and I'd like to talk a little bit about safety and making bicycle riding even safer. And Jessica, I believe that's your area of expertise. Mm -hmm. What can we do to make bicycle riding safer? Thank you for saying even safer, because it's, it's not that dangerous. You know, Ray and I talk a lot about crashes and, and the need to make things safer, and that's because we're overachievers and because, you know, any crash is one too many. But it's really a very safe activity. Um, and I think there are lots of individual strategies, but the big recipe, it's really easy. I, you know, what we need to do to make bicycling safer is get more people on bikes and slow cars down. Um, and national and international research says that um, uh, e every additional bike on the road makes it safer for the cyclists who are already there. Um, and we've seen that in, well, 
Portland uh, keeps better crash statistics um, and ridership statistics than most places, so I, I'll cite that as an example. Um, over the last decade, we've seen ridership, bicycle ridership triple, and the number of crashes has stayed the same, so the crash rate is, is going down fast. And, and so, you know, more bikes on the road means things are safer. Similarly, as, as I mentioned before, high speed, high volume auto traffic, not good for bikes. So, mm -hmm. you know, we need to really help, um, especially on neighborhood streets, you know, slow cars down and provide great low traffic traffic, low-speed routes for bicycles. Tell me a little bit about citizen-initiated enforcement. That's a new one on me. I had to it's, read it. It's new to you. It's new to almost everyone except for uh, uh, Ray. Uh, can I call it your baby? Well, I it's guess it is, new it, thing. it is sort of my baby because... And we have just uh, a minute left, so let's see right. how okay. that up. Well, um, uh, sometimes, as I said, um, it's really clear that the motorist was in the wrong and perhaps the cyclist even was badly hurt, and there is simply no police follow-up, no, no citation, uh, nothing goes on their record. Um, and so there's a clause in the law which allows citizens to actually write um, a traffic ticket uh, as a police officer would, go to court, the burden of proof is on the cyclist, you have to fill out a lot of paperwork. Um, it's not a slam dunk, but we recently had two separate cases uh, where the cyclist took a motorist to court and successfully, uh, you know, went through the whole process, and and they both of them pled guilty. So, it's it's a new idea and one we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to use this tool. But it's it's exciting and interesting. Before our time gets away from us, I wanted to ask you a general question about. Um, where you can get more information. And Ray, you've mentioned a website, and say the name of that oh, website yes. again. Um, we've got a, uh, a website that includes the Pedal Power book in PDF format, so folks can look at it, and it includes the law and articles. And it's at uh, stc-law.com, and it also contains a number of articles about bike law subjects. Mm -hmm. And do you have a, a, where else can people get resources for? Um, well, our, our organization, the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, is Oregon's uh, bicycle advocacy group, so you can find out more information at bta4bikes.org, and that's B as in boy, T-A, the number four, B-I-K-E-S dot O-R-G. Very good. Well, I appreciate your both being with us. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Thank you, Ray and Jessica. We appreciate your providing us with a wealth of information about bicycles on, on the road in Oregon. More information about this subject and others is available to you online. Just visit the Oregon State Bar's website at www.oregonstatebar.org. Our website contains a wide array of information on legal topics. And while you're there, you can comment on this program or give suggestions for future programs. I hope you found this program helpful and informative. On behalf of the Oregon State Bar, I thank you for joining us. And I hope to see you next time on Legal Links.